Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Seeking Play. My name is Dr. Jane Hessian. My name is Ronan Healy. And I'd also like to remind our viewers at home that you can watch our interviews on YouTube and also on Spotify. This week's guest was Michael Schrag. Michael is a research fellow with the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research, writing, and advisory work focuses on the behavioral economics of models, prototypes, and metrics as strategic resources for managing innovation risks and opportunity. He is an author of the award-winning book, The Innovator's Hypothesis, another book called Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become, and a seminal book for us, which is called Serious Play, and his final book, and most recent, is Recommendation Engines. Now, having rewatched Michael's wonderful interview, we have picked out three quotes that we would like to share with you that we really enjoyed. As you play, you are discovering aspects of your environment and yourself. The great insight I took from writing serious play was that you can't be serious without playing. Without play, you don't know what the real parameters are. Play is the best of both worlds. You get intellectual stimulation and emotional stimulation, which creates more accurate situational awareness. Now, having watched the, the episode a number of times, um, we picked out another quote because we felt that it really um, uh, reflected the kind of spirit of, of having these conversations. And uh, Michael said that the best scientists and engineers at MIT that are decades older than me are as playful as any high school students. And as I said, like it, we think this kind of is a nice um, uh, reflection on uh, partly the, the need for this podcast to highlight that to be described as playful in the workplace, it shouldn't be a stigma. It should be seen as a strength. Um, you know, we just don't see that a leadership strength, uh, the many attributes that are kind of pointed out on a day to day basis, you'll see it on LinkedIn and you'll never see playfulness as one of those and we just think uh, Michael captured it so perfectly uh, we had a wonderful time having a conversation with with Michael um, again like everything we'll link um, books and and uh, publications in the show notes but for us serious play is something you you really have to go and read enjoy thank you folks bye, take folks. care bye Michael, you are very welcome to the Seeking Play podcast. Thank you so much for being our guest today. We are very excited to talk to you. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come this afternoon. I'm, I'm flattered and nervous in equal measure, but it's a pleasure. As, as, as we are too. So, <laughs> so that's okay. You're in good company. Michael, I am going to take you back to your childhood. And I would like if you could share with our listeners... What were you like as a kid? So this was the question that most frightened me. Um, it's not like I'm seeking to black out or minimize or marginalize my childhood. It's just that I'm biased. You'd be better off asking my parents or my friends or my sibling. Um, I recall being a child with a lot of energy, a sense of mischief, um, I did not like being told what to do. I was very, very curious. Uh, I did like to play. I played a lot. I recall having a vivid imagination, but I also recall liking to be left alone, liking to be alone with my own thoughts, playing on the jungle gym, imagining doing this or doing that um running around and and uh, you know to use an american phrase picking my spots as to when i would really engage with people on their terms let alone my terms i think i was a child that required to be disciplined uh, i was the sort of child where my brother and i apologize to him in his absence here uh, if my brother was going to do something naughty and, you know, mom and dad stare, caught him, he would freeze. Uh, if I was going to do something naughty and mom or dad stare, caught me, um, I would I would absolutely go ahead, press on, you know, <laughs> go for it on, on this. 
The complicating factor, which probably would put me on a couch or require this interview to be done at a couch, is I, I loved my parents. They were terrific people. I felt they were very good parents, but they were not really comfortable with children. My brother and I were really more miniature adults than, than children. And so the notion of, you'll forgive my framing here, what was serious and what was playful was always a bit of a jumble in my interactions with them. So it was, it was, uh, it was, a, it was entertaining. I, and again, full disclosure, my parents, I come from a, an academic family. I grew up in Hyde Park in Chicago and, and, you know, the intellect was probably more valued than, than emotional intelligence. So, so that, that of course has been a theme that has played out in innumerable relations, but that would be for another podcast, probably done, <laughs> probably done anonymously. So. And, and as you, you're taking that kind of trip down memory lane, can, can you think about any... It was a stumble. It was a stumble. A, stumble. <laughs> a literal trip. Yes. <laughs> um, any bumps, bruises, scrapes, breaks, or, or, or little mini adventures that you can think back um, as, a, as a kid that helped form your identity as an adult? You know, interestingly, I was, I was a very physically active child. I never broke anything. You know, I had the usual bumps, scrapes, and bruises. I threw myself into sports. Um, you know, I did, quote unquote, hurt myself, but nothing that I considered to be, um, you know, out of the ordinary for, for a child. I, but, I, but I will say, and it was prompted by the question and the hideous, you know, uh, flashbacks that, that, that were incited by, by it or by them, I, I was the kind of child who would go into a tunnel or climb up in a tree and, and, and basically get myself trapped. Okay. And, and I would, I would, I would more often than not find my way out, but the, the, the level of adrenaline associated with the retreat was, was a, a different quality than the adventure. So, so um, at risk of sounding like a military guy, um, those, that, that sort of experience really made me, you know, hairs on the back of the neck. I really became very situationally aware. I rarely go somewhere without checking out the room. I am the kind of guy who, when I go into a restaurant, do not sit with my back to the entrance on, on this. So, so I, I take the older I've become, the, the more I have taken situational awareness seriously. Mm. That, that's an interesting thing i mean for us you know our, our play odyssey our understanding where you, you play a very important part from a let's say from a corporate perspective but our, our understanding of the importance of risky play mm -hmm. and 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 self-regulation that goes with that when you put yourself in that tricky situation um it does seem to to stay with you uh, but, so but, but but you see this is one of the issues that i had with the the questions in the conversation because i am either either dualistic, Cartesian, or schizophrenic enough that there really is a difference in my mind and in my heart and in my body as mm. to what constitutes emotional risk versus physical risk. Mm. You know, being physically hurt actually bothers me less than being emotionally hurt. Mm. And that's one of the interesting things about, about play, you know, which is, which is you, you, if somebody, you know, the book Serious Play, somebody's so committed to something that the emotions associated with disappointment or not getting from the experience that you want, you know, to mix a metaphor, that's a, that's a, a punch, feels yep. like a punch. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are other times that you feel something bad, you're hurt physically, but emotionally it has minimal impact. You, really, all you're feeling is the the physical pain and the issue is physical pain management, not emotional hurt. And hearkening back to the original childhood question, you know, I, I, you know, I find physical pain way easier and more enjoyable 
to manage than the other kind of pain. Mm -hmm. So obviously keeping on track with, you know, play, can yes. I ask you about what adult playfulness would mean to you, Michael? Well, actually I, I would, I'm comfortable connecting it to, to, to childhood play. I mm -hmm. mean, that, that I think there are two things and it ties into the theme of situational awareness. Mm -hmm. If, and, and, and it's the approach, uh, the affect and the effect mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that I brought and, and still, I hope, still bring to it, which is that as you play, you are discovering, it's a discovery, aspects of your environment, mm -hmm. the rules, and yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I didn't expect that, or how clever of me, or challenging this is. So, so I think there's a different level of emotional maturity and intellectual maturity and engagement. But I really do see a very interesting duality between play as a discovery process and play as a construction or making process. And if you do it right, you know, the motto of MIT is men's at, man, men's at manus, you know, mind and hands. Mm -hmm. If you do it right, you're discovering as you're making and you're making as you're discovering. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a rush. It's a high. It's, it's, it's where you get the best of both worlds. You get the, the intellectual stimulation and you get the emotional stimulation. And just to, again, to give the illusion of continuity, it enhances your situational awareness about the situation and yourself in, mm -hmm. in, in that situation. Yeah. Okay, and, 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 and Mike, in your work, how do you strike or how, how, do you, how do you do your best to strike a balance between taking work seriously, but, but also not taking it too seriously? Um, that is an interesting and challenging question because in my professional life, I view, I, and I'm not trying to sound either modest or, or like a, a good person or a better person than I am. Um, I'm more concerned about my students or my clients in that regard. You know, how I feel is secondary to whether they have that sense of discovery and do they derive satisfaction out of it? You know, it, it, getting people, I just, I just literally did a, a, a Zoom with people in South Africa and we were talking about designing of experiments playing with experiments. And I, you know, I was getting some of the feedback and the feedback of my host was, you know, a couple of the companies, they're, 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 they're so intent on hitting their numbers on improving their KPIs, their key performance indicators, that they're afraid to play. They're afraid, to, they, they view play as a distraction rather than as a better way to focus on the outcomes they wish to achieve. You know, how you engage with that kind of person or that kind of organization has to be different than how you're dealing with somebody saying, you know, we we really believe that as we look out over the next 12, 18, 24 months, we want the way we innovate and engage with our customers, our clients and partners, you know, to, to be rooted in a more playful, more discovery oriented collaborative sense. And, and so it's a horses for courses issue. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not giving you the, the, the direct answer, but the, yeah, but, the, yeah. but the reality is, and I, I mean this, you know, you know, the Robert Greenleaf work on, you know, the servant leader. Um, I really view in my engagement with students and clients, you know, and, and, and I, I really like yourselves. I see myself as a facilitator and, and, what gets me out of my comfort comfort zone is, and I'd be curious what your reaction is, but what makes me nervous and apprehensive, although it plays a big role in professional development is if I can't read the room, if I can't tell if people aren't engaged because of my failure, the design of the task, them as individuals, them as part of a team, them as part of a culture, you know, is it is it something they misunderstand conceptually? Is it something they don't feel they don't feel comfortable uh, uh, being vulnerable in that way? 
you know, one thing I should say about my background, which is, sorry for going on, but one, one thing I should say about my background was when I was in high school, American high school, uh, um, uh, uh, 14 to 17, I, I mentioned I'm from Chicago. I was very interested, you know, in improvisational comedy, The Second City. Uh, um, I loved improv. It was creativity within structure. I didn't like being on stage, but I did like coming up with the, the first line, last line, the props to be used. How do you create an environment and a set of interactions that on average will lead to, with, that will bring out the best in the actors and make the audience feel more comfortable participating? Mm -hmm. You know, so as you can see now, that, that the more I'm talking here, it's become clear that how do you design these things? becomes more important. What's, you know, with apologies to Roger Martin and Herb Simon and the quote design thinking crowd, you know, what, what is the design for in the moment? What is the, the design for, for the next moment? And how is that a subset or a derivative in both the calculus and the chemistry sense of the word of what we're really trying to accomplish? And, and again, um, it's not about me, it's about them. When I'm working on my projects, I can be about me until the cows come home, as my wife and colleagues will, 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 will tell you. But in, a, in an educational and facilitative environment, I really want to be as sensitive and aware as possible to what's best for the people I'm working with or for. That's wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, again, speaks to um, again, it's about about treating the the, the playful um, emergence that's happening seriously. So again, serious yes. play, inextricably interlinked. Um, and I think some of the best work we've done, uh, maybe in a more service design. So like we're trying to map uh, 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 blueprints and journey maps. Right. Uh, once you understand that the 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 interpersonal dynamics are the thing that really should be, mm -hmm. you know, at least explored we kind of step off the stage as a facilitator because you they were post-it notes and you're mapping very linear you know process procedures you know types of technology and i think some of the mo more meaningful um blueprinting sessions were not about the blueprinting session and they stopped and they ended and you just step in, into that level of vulnerability to say look maybe it's not about this maybe it's and just explore it mm -hmm. um but that, that takes it's a risk you're identifying what makes what we're doing so difficult because you really do want to have an effective outcome, but the affective process sometimes is a spice, sometimes it's a, an ingredient, and sometimes it's the whole meal in, in, in that regard. Um, you know, one thing I do want to stress you, as, as important as serious play is, as important as experimentation is, important as these facilitative sessions are, they're means to an end. Mm -hmm. And and this is the dichotomy, this is the this is the tension that that you know I can never get right because it's dynamic and there are certain emergent properties, mm -hmm. which is which is, you know, to what extent does the means really expand, improve, or refine and focus the end we wish we we wish to achieve? Mm -hmm. Is it if we're working for a corporate client, is it about the customer experience? Is it about brand health? What are the measures and metrics of accountability that we seek to optimize, negotiate? or define an appropriate trade-off for. And the challenge that I run across time and time again is when you ask these, to my mind, seemingly simple and fundamental questions, obvious questions, it's remarkable, and this is going to sound horrible, it's remarkable how ill thought out and rigor free so many of the answers are on, yeah. on this. And so that's a concern that 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 I have because sometimes I'll, I'll use the the B word. I end up having to bully, or my my questioning is interpreted as bullying and interrogation because I really want to push people to articulate 
what they want what, or what they say they want. And, and now we reach the other great tension, which is actions speak louder than words. Here's what they say they want, but for whatever reason, their actions aren't aligned on this. And so this is why, you know, forgive me for ending with, with the title of the book, the great insight, he says modestly, that I came away with from doing the work and writing the book was that for things that are really, really important, you can't be serious without playing. Mm -hmm. yep. You're, you're just, just defining one's terms and defining you, your schedule and going ahead. Actually, you're not being serious mm -hmm. because, because if you don't play, you don't know what the real parameters are. You know, I'll go back to my dad. Um, one of the things that my father said that, that I, I won't say one of the few things that my father said, but one of the things my father said that I took very, very seriously was that there are always two reasons for something, a good reason and the real reason. Mm -hmm. And with smart people, there's no shortage of good reasons. But, but you really need to do serious play to discover, identify, categorize, and explore the real reasons. Yeah. I think it's a great segue to your book. Yes. <laughs> OK. So, Michael, your book, Serious Play, How the World's Best Companies Simulate to Innovate, was published 23 years ago. It is one of the most influential books that shaped our appreciation of serious play. And we really do consider it the first book that anybody should read if they are interested in you're, serious you're, play. You're, you're, you're very kind. Uh, devotees of Edward <laughs> DeFranco might disagree, but I can live with your kind. <laughs> so, We're just pandering. We're just pandering. So, we do this. I, I, can, I can live with that. I can live with that. Yes. <laughs> So, Michael, can I ask you, how has the meaning of play changed since you wrote your book? Well, that, that is an interesting question and fraught because it, it, it could tie into how has the meaning of play qua play changed and how has the meaning of play for people like myself changed? Um, I'll offer two brief answers to, to cover that. Um, I, I think, and this will come as no surprise, I think, I believe, and multi-billion dollar industries bear testimony to this, bear testament to this, that the economics of play, the modes of representation of play, uh, um, you know, modding, Minecraft, the digitalization of play and environments and tools and platforms, has really changed the boundaries of, of what we can discover. What we discover in the digital world is different than what we can discover in the physical world. And when you begin to throw in things like, forgive me, generative AI and large language models and DALI, our, our imagination's ability to play and discover and build representations that we play with and play for has been transformed. Um, so, so I believe the technology, the infrastructure, the ontology of play itself has been changed by the tools. I, I mentioned as a child, I loved sports. You know, the, the, the notion of play with a ball is different than the notion of play um, in, a, in a swimming pool or in the water. So what, what, are, what are the ways we in, and, and we are we playing quote unquote for fun? Are we playing to win? So all of the dimensions, all of the features are fundamentally changed by environments and the cost of exploring that environments. Uh, um, and 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 to just to double down that that the role in 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 the in this year as you and I talk, the role of imagination is is. The digitalization as an imagination amplifier is 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 remarkable to me. It blows me away, and I see this with my colleagues at MIT or at Imperial, or or in China. It's it's just remarkable what creative people are doing and playing with. As for myself, my my notion of play has has unsurprisingly become schizophrenic because. 
you know, I'm asking myself more and more, why am I playing? Am I playing as a means to an end? Am I playing to enjoy myself? Am I playing to discover elements and aspects of myself that I that I didn't have? Or when I deal with my niece and my nephew, my nieces and my nephews, am I playing to, yes, build a relationship that otherwise, a relationship and a bond that otherwise wouldn't exist? Some of this is purely a function of maturity. You know, there's the wonderful line from Shaw, since, you know, where there's you all are quote unquote Irish, although there's the Australian aspect where, where you, you know, you, you, you don't uh, uh, stop playing when you grow old, you, you, you grow old because you stop playing in this, in this regard. Uh, and I see this again with the, the best quote unquote scientists and engineers at MIT, the, the, the people who are literally decades older than I am are as playful as any undergraduates or high school students I know. Not silly play, but the, the, the sense of curiosity, wonder, manipulation, let's give it a go, let's take a chance, let's go into that tunnel, let's climb that tree. That, that sense of exploration is still a part of who they are and who they think of themselves mm -hmm. as, as being. So the, so the, the, real, the real way play has changed for me. It allows me to discover aspects of myself and people I care about and people I don't care as much about dif differently. Mm -hmm. um, in my professional sphere, and again, my apologies for the length of this answer, but I blame you, you, you people for asking these questions. Um, th when we look at the professional aspects of these things, what the, my, the meaning of play has changed because I now can be more focused and fine tuned about, am I, am I playing to expose and reveal a vulnerability or to make it easier for people to deal with vulnerability, to protect themselves? Am I giving them a shield? Am I giving them guardrails? You know, that's, that, what, what does safe play mean relative to risky play? And I have to become more self-conscious and self-aware about their perceptions of these things. And we're back to your facilitated empathy. But the, the bandwidth, the tools, the technologies for doing this have fundamentally changed. To make a vulgar but relevant comparison, it's the difference between using an X-ray and an MRI scanner, for example. The, the bandwidth the level of resolution, the granularity, the ability to to take a snapshot or a or a snippet of a process is is easier, simpler, and clearer. And I'm challenged to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Please don't apologize for these. No. We're just bathing in your intellect. That's just that's what we're doing. Yeah. Again, we're pandering, and we're also pandering again. So I apologize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're you're not kidding about the pub metaphor because I would be having a drink at the uh, <laughs> every every time every time the word pander is mentioned. Drink. You know? it's, a, it's a drinking game. Yeah. For context, uh, for listeners, we, my, my, Michael was very kind, saying, "Look, you know, what kind of what, what are we aiming for?" And we just said, "We're just in a pub." We're just having a little, having a, a little, a little chin wag in a pub. So, and, and again, no need to apologize for the, these wonderful answers. No. So, if if your if if your conception of, of play has changed, has you, your conception of serious changed in the in the last twenty years? What what you would term to be a serious? Wow. Um, I, you know, yes, but but you know that 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 there's a subtlety and a nuance there because I always considered myself, quote unquote, serious, all the jobs and responsibilities I had, I considered to be serious. But, but I think, you know, in the pandemic was a, was a great highlight of, of, of this. You realize, depending upon the choices that you make, um, and I'll give you a good example in a moment, that, that you really, have to be serious slash respectful of the needs of other people and their and their families. You know the the the, the whole notion of not just the person who comes to work, but the person, the, the whole person. And I think that was to me 
uh, one of the most important aspects of the pandemic and that you, you could always, when you were quote unquote working, draw relatively clear and distinct lines between the person who chose the identity, you know, Irving Goffman's a representation of self in everyday life, the, the person who comes to work and, you know, what they were like afterwards. And if you wanted to share, that was mutually done. Now, everybody, you, you literally saw where people lived, their animals, their kids, et cetera. And so, you know, there were, there were no clean lines of demarcation. Mm-hmm. Now, my wife um, is a CEO of a, of a company and is part of a multi-billion dollar, you know, WPP, multi-billion dollar company. You know, she, t- she excellent leader, very, very much focused on, on the, whole, the whole person of the people and of portfolio of people who she manages. I, back to childhood, I, you know, I like people. Some of my best friends are, 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 are people, but, but I, I want to work with and manage people for certain projects, certain deliverables. I want to have, I want to have an exit strategy when I'm working with people. I mean, that's not to say I don't have and haven't had lifelong friends, but, but I, you know, I, I am not making the same deliberately chosen word, serious commitment to people that, that, that my wife does. And so that is, is an issue. And so the, the challenge that, that people like myself, people with my profile have is, you know, how do you avoid turning people in, in, into a means, back to experimentation, to a means to an end for the project? That doesn't work. I, I you know, that was my 20s. You know, mm-hmm. I was a fantastic colleague, so long as you didn't make any emotional demands on me on, on, on this. Uh, you could make any technical demands, any project related, and, and in fairness to me, you know, if, if somebody was sick and you had to go, I'm, you know, I'm fine on that. I, you know, that's reality. But, but it's all in d- to deliver an X. Yeah. And, and, but once the X was delivered, you know, it became an option how we proceeded on, on this. So again, a long-winded way of really d- d- uh, of saying that that the the full richness of what serious means as you become mature and or hopefully become mature and and people who you work with have different kinds of responsibilities and you know let's face it if you're forgive me 25 and in the pub and you're looking for what's the word you guys use and the Commonwealth, you know, looking for a shag, you're different, your, 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 your notion of playfulness and seriousness is rather different than, than we all have families that we go back to. Oh, and in addition to a family, I have a deliverable that matters, or there's an operation in a hospital, or I'm doing the sort of analytics upon, you know, which will have the have an impact on literally thousands of people, the quality of thousands of people's lives or standards of living. So, so again, I use the ontology word with play. I'm going to use it with seriousness. The fundamental ontology of seriousness has changed. And now I'll say something for related to facilitators. Uh, this is another issue I have with my classes and my clients is that oftentimes they have a too narrow and focused notion of what seriousness means. What is one of the legacy ways, and you know this from your serious play work, most large legacy organizations are run in silos. Mm -hmm. If if you're simply optimizing performance and play within a silo, you're you're not being serious because these things have to be orchestrated, coordinated, collaborated. So I would wager both formally and informally, you are pushing some of the organizations in your workshop to be a little more, if not cross-functional, open to collaboration and conversation and exchange because, because that shared understanding, that shared space is going to create new opportunities for discovery and value creation. Nice. I'm, I'm sorry that I keep degenerating into 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 lecture, but but it'll be it'd be even worse if I was if I was drinking. You know, I would then I then you know just be grabbing. That's, that, that's, that's for season two. Okay, we're just going to insist all of our, our guests are uh, yeah, mildly inebriated. 
<laughs> yeah. it'll it'll be serious play stranger things <laughs> michael your follow-up book who do you want your customers to become at yeah. just one pages is a short but a very very insightful book yeah. i'm going to read a short passage providing the answer is not the answer i prefer presenting clients and students with approaches that is methods tools and frameworks that put greater power in their hands and minds that's more sustainable so i think that this really spoke to us as it's obviously the fundamental way that we would approach work with our clients because it's all very much about co-creation and capability right. so, so my question for you yeah. oh sorry you go no, no go ahead <laughs> okay my question for you michael will be in your experience how do clients and students respond to being presented with approaches rather than definitive answers and well, that, are there any common challenges that arise from this approach well i was actually going to you know the reason why i was jumping ahead there because i knew that's where we we're going and this must be the issue that you have this is there's a wonderful line from uh the the British, the late British economist, Kenneth Boulding, you know, he said that you can divide the world into two groups of people, those who divide the world into two groups of people and those who don't. And, and you must have the situation where you're running the workshop. And I, I, I won't presume to say, but my guess would be between five out of 10 and seven out of 10 of your clients expect, quote unquote, the solution to emerge. They're hiring you to, quote unquote, solve their problem or explicitly address the opportunity. And, and um, my view is even if you could, it wouldn't be a, a good thing mm -hmm. to do. That's sort of an outsourced issue. That's one of the biggest challenges that I have. And, and when I wrote that, that was as much a disclaimer and a warning as it was me trying to be virtuous and how I'm positioning myself. I believe that the cultivation of capability is what we should be we should be emphasizing because we want people to become more self-sufficient, more resilient, more reliable without the the uh, prosthetics and crutches of experts and facilitators. Um, I get enormous and have gotten enormous pushback when I talk about executive education is not about being the transmission of expertise, the better trans. I have expertise. How do I better transmit it versus the cultivation of capability? There are a lot of people who come in and say, you know, solve my problem. Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. You know, that's that's the joke. But the, the real issue is not um, how do we, quote unquote, solve. Well, sometimes it is, you know, which is an important understanding to reach. But the issue is what do what. What do you want to be doing a year hence, two years hence? Um, this is one of the big issues that my, my wife's company is coming across, that they get hired to solve certain problems. And then as the value becomes clear of what they're doing, it's like, geez, we need an internal capability for this. But none of the people that they've hired or trained or recognized and awarded have that. So, so you know, that is one of the things that goes right back to the notion of seriousness. One of the things I want to get up front with serious clients, with serious students are, are you looking to have a short-term problem solved or go away? Or are you looking to build a capability to generate meaningful and measurable value along whatever dimensions you want to generate that, that value um, over time? And and I run into serious issues because a lot of people say they want the latter, but what they really want is they want the effing problem to go away. Make the problem go away. And then what do we do? We turn and read about the fentanyl crisis. You know, people, you know, back to the pub, drinking to anesthetize themselves. This, this... I think it's a really, I'm sorry, I think pun intended, it's a really, really serious issue. My philosophy is I want people who come to my classes and come to my workshops and who work with me to be able to look back 6, 12, 18 months or years later and say, you know, I, I really became more capable 
along dimensions I hadn't expected. The flip side is you also want people to say, I went to them and, and he, she, they helped solve our problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like, it's like losing weight. You know, people follow a diet, they lose the weight, and you see them two, three years later or six months later, and did you really solve the problem? Mm -hmm. I would say no. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I I'm sorry to be so depressing, but this is the answer. No, 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 hey, I love it. I, that's I, I it. I absolutely love it. This, this is exactly like we we have on our website you know we help people solve problems only because if we didn't have that people would just see lego and just go they what do they exactly. do? Yeah. but when we work with clients we, one we will say look can we park the concept of a workshop because we think it, it's loaded with outcome based um uh, perceptions we're going to help you have a more meaningful conversation and because if it's a conversation you should treat it lighter but it will create particular affordances. So again, you're, you're speak of or you're talking of like play creating. Essentially affordances. Affordances. I, can, I can live with affordances. You can live with affordances. I'm with that. Sure. And, and then, and then, you know, and, and we would say being playful creates social affordances again, back to identity, seeing people in a different perspective, seeing yourself in a different light, but then so much of the work we'll do is okay. Re reflecting on the workshop, or the conversation, how can we support you between the next conversation we might have in a couple of quarters, in a quarter or two quarters? So my, my only pushback to what you said, which I largely agree with, is, you know, there's quote unquote talk therapy. If you haven't looked at Virginia Sater's work on people making well worth looking at, um, it's, it's, I'm back to the MIT motto. Um, it's not enough to have a conversation you have to get people to build things. One of the reasons why the serious play Lego style thing works is that they're they're building stuff. Maybe you call use the word play shop instead of workshop. Maybe maybe you you expand the boundaries of what a prototype or a model or a representation is. Um, but but the the to me it's it's how do you affect it's multiple dimensions. It just can't be sort of ironic talking about large language models. It just can't be text. Mm -hmm. It just can't be imagery. It, it it has to be the intersection and the collision and the fusion effect, affect, means and ends. I, I, I know that there's a bit of a word salad aspect to it, but but you you, you it really, it, you know what? So we're all old enough on this call to remember in the early days of design, it was called user interface design. Mm -hmm. you know, after we built this incredibly complex thing, we would quote unquote, slap an interface mm -hmm. on it. And you know, then you had to manage the exceptions, blah, blah, blah. And the revolution, and I give full marks to the, to the Steve Jobses of the world. It was no, I mean, yes, there's a logic to the interface, but what we should really care about, you know, we're back to Jonathan Ive, what we should really care about is UX, the user experience. We need a broad, we need a fuller bandwidth notion of what do we want the user experience to be? And the, the you know, for whatever it's worth, one of the, one of the tricks and cliches is that, is that we get people to talk about the user experience, the user journey, and then we inject a different design uh, uh, parameter on them. We talk about, okay, what should the user experience trajectory be? And this ties into the book, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the best and worst phrases for, for innovators and entrepreneurs is, you know, product market fit. Mm -hmm. Great, you have product market fit. And then what happens 12 to 18 months later, people realize they want to do this kind of thing versus that kind of thing. So, oh, so we'll do a version 2.0, 3.0. That's, that's a, what trajectory do we want the user experience to have? What's a better way of framing or understanding that? Who do we want our customers to become? Mm -hmm. the, the, the design conversations and the debates about who do you want your best customers to become versus who do you want your most typical customers to become transformed? What's the difference? What's the difference in the persona? 
the, the, the cheap default is, oh, we want our typical customers to become more like our best customers. Mm. You know? But you're really pushing and challenging people to, you know, what does, what does the composition of their human capital, capability, competencies, and creativity look like mm. over time? How do we design for that? How do we, forgive me, seriously play with, with that portfolio, with those alternatives? That's what I'm trying to push people on. And, and, and that's not what they should be coming to me or outsiders for, although outsiders should definitely participate in that. They need to have that capability for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's that to me is what that's what I want. That's what I want for my my classes and my clients. Capability, a, a capability fused with creativity, and and so that that they can seriously play with what they want. Mm -hmm. Sorry again, my apology. Oh, Don't apologize. And 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 I think. So again, perfect segue into your book. Uh, like, who do you want uh, customers to become? Are we reading too much into this where there's a sense of process philosophy? So you're not necessarily specifically looking at yeah, like a fixed, rigid solving for the immediate in terms of your customer. Is there more of a processual or am I just going to shoot? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> ab 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 absolutely. And, and, and this is where, where you know, there is let's you know, let, let's 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 you know be honest on this this is one of the tensions we talked earlier in the conversation about silos we could talk about process um i had when i was younger um you know fairly serious chops and oh uh, operations research what the brits call operational research you know and what's the what's the gold standard and the holy grail of of or and process optimization how do we optimize the process you know how do we optimize the silo that's the wrong thing to be optimizing you know you you don't want to optimize the 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 wrong process or a a you don't want to optimize the process the wrong process too soon yep. you know that's the difference between and and this by the way we're back to digital um there's a difference between optimizing a process and optimizing a platform you have you know how how do you get developers how do you get clients how do you get customers how do you get users to engage with a platform so as to generate the positive externalities forgive the economics phrase of network effects you know that's what gives you a TikTok. that's what gives you the amazon recommender system that's what gives you google that's what's beginning to give you chat gpt with rlahf you know reinforcement learning human feedback how do you create these virtuous cycles for growth so it's not just how do you design a moment in time it's how do you design and enable a dynamic yeah. and that's you know when i did my work on research on you guys Clearly, that's what you're interested in, in in promoting because we're not just interested as important as moments in time are. A, a movie is not, you know, we're back to 24 frames a second. It's not just, well, let, we'll look at these individual photographs really quickly. There's a flow involved. There's a flow involved. And, and there's an experience of, of, of being a part of that flow. What do we want that experience to look and feel like? How do we design for that? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so great about the issues that we're discussing here, because you can't do that without seriously playing. Yeah. You can't. You can't. Yeah. And 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 okay, that's wonderful. I, I literally I was wondering, like, are we just shoehorning process? Because it, it it does speak to to the way we view again our transition from the word workshop. It just feels kind of static and rigid, whereas a conversation is is more fluid, and you're going from one conversation. Not to say that, and I think partly as well, people are thinking if you're having a conversation, you don't use your hands. I think we're we're believing that conversations are you 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 can build and create whilst so. So I'm I'm interrupting and I'm I'm going to give you know keeping in mind that free consulting is 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 worth what you pay for it. You see, I think the real reason why you don't like using the word workshop is that it's a legacy word that builds up the wrong expectations and has certain things uh, pushed to it. So 
I did work with a magazine 20 years ago, and they talked about a retreat, organizing a retreat. And, and I said with tongue not completely in cheek, um, no, you guys are thought leaders. You don't have retreats, you have advances. And so that's what they called it. They called it the advance. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I, I think it would be a good discipline for, for you in collaboration with a couple of your clients to say, what should we call these sessions? Because it's not just a conversation and it's not a workshop. Play shop, you know, was, was you know, something I coughed up like a cat and a fur ball, you know, but, but th there is something about the dynamic and experience about, mm -hmm. about what you're doing that, that you want it to have a twofold impact. You want it to be a, 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 an invitation, but you also want it to play a role in setting and managing expectations for the participants, you know, and, and a workshop, you know, it's like, it's like going to class, Yeah. you know, you're going to be sitting at a desk, you're going to be taking notes and somebody at the front is going to be with a whiteboard or a blackboard or a PowerPoint or keynote is going to be giving a talk on this. Yeah. And, and, and they know this from university because, because if you're at an Oxford, if you're at a tutorial session, it's different than a seminar, is different than a class. So I, I think it probably is going to be worth your while to do that review and say, you know, what do people really get out of this? How do we name it differently? You know, let's, let's, let's commit to, you know, nomina sunt realia, you know, the way it's named, uh, shapes and influences the reality that's experienced. Yeah. Forgive my lecture. I'm, I'm just totally defaulting into lecture, lecture mode. Well, I think We've that got that's, some homework. Yes, we definitely do. And some <laughs> research. No, but but I you know, wholeheartedly agree. I definitely, because I think a lot of people then have expectations mm -hmm. about a workshop. Yeah, you know? it's so loaded. Definitely, yeah, it is loaded for sure. Okay, I am going to move on. I am going to move on to your third book, The Innovator's Hypothesis: How right. Cheap Experiments Are Worth More Than Good Ideas. Right. So obviously it provides advice for hypothesis-based iterative learning. So I would like to talk to you a bit about and ask you to explain the five by five by five matrix. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, this ties into the thing I was doing in Cape Town and Joburg, you know, by Zoom literally the other day. <clears throat> um, quick bit of background, and, and I will do da lossy data compression on, on, on this. So I was doing a lot of work with organizations on design stuff, prototyping. Mm -hmm. and, and some of my clients and classes were saying, well, this is great, but, but we, we don't have that many designers, and it, the designers are sort of hived away we need things that that the entire organization can be a part of and but but michael it can't be too exp expensive and too risky and it can't be too sophisticated so oh so you want something quick and dirty yeah, sure you know so i was into rapid prototyping and and you know the insight that i had was that a prototype is a hypothesis okay so let's flip it let's focus on the hypothesis as a unit of analysis and there was a pathology I observed in virtually every single organization that I worked with. And then it goes back to the nomina sunt reality, nomina sunt realia issue we just discussed a moment ago. And that is most organizations say they want good ideas. Give me a good idea. I want a good idea. By the way, one of the best brands in the world. It's a good idea. Who wants a mediocre idea or a bad idea? Good idea. Well, good ideas are good. It's a tautology. It's an identity. It's, it's not an insight. But what do we invariably and inevitably find 30, 60, 90 days after we all agree that this is a good idea? It seemed like a good idea at the time. And the opportunity cost, the discovery process associated with realizing, actually, it's not that good of an idea, uh, uh, means that you need a different unit of analysis. So I literally say to organizations, Wherever you see the phrase good idea, do a global search and replace between good idea and testable hypothesis. Because if you cannot transform your good idea into a testable hypothesis, it's, it's not a good idea. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just look at the history of science. <laughs> so, you know, there's a real world. Now, but, but here's the fundamental difference. In science, a hypothesis and an experiment is a search for truth. In business, 
hypothesis and experiment is a search for value. Now, truth and value are not enemies. They're not inimical to one another. They're not opposed, but they're not the same thing. So your design sensibility for a hypothesis and experiment to discover, seriously play with value creation is different than, quote unquote, the truth. And that was the, the overarching organizing principle. The five by five was a cheat. It was basically saying you give five people no more than five days to come up with a portfolio of five hypotheses and five experiments. Neither, no experiment can cost more than $5,000 or take more than five weeks to run. And you have to do a back of the envelope calculation that shows it'll generate $500,000 or $5 million worth of euros or pounds of insight. And it's not like I love the number five. It was altogether now design within constraints. That's all it is. It's a design within constraints. I've had organizations do three by threes, four by fours, seven by sevens. But you know, the, 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 the key is you, you, the cultural, organizational, and operational transformation is that you get people thinking in terms of testable hypotheses, not, an, and I, you know, I don't mean to slag on the Germans, but, but when I did this with German companies who shall remain nameless, one of the real pushbacks were the kind of experiments and hypotheses they wanted to do would be to, back to the original conversation we had about 30 minutes ago, they wanted to solve the problem. Germans want a solution, a precise solution. I'm saying that's too expensive. That's too comprehensive. Yes, we'll get there. The issue is what insight can we generate that buys us a lot of risk reduction and visibility into the opportunity and to how we can scale these things. So the purpose of these experiments is to generate actionable insights that scale. And you know, these insights give you unexpected clarity that matters because if it's expected, what was the effing point? And if it doesn't matter, it's at the margins. So you don't need to do the experiment on these things. I would argue that these are all very simple, fundamental issues. But you know, when people have been raised in an organization and are acculturated in certain ways, they don't want to be seen as taking the shortcut. They, they, they think that the experiment might fail. But no, it doesn't fail if, you've, if the value of what you've learned is more than the cost of the experiment. You, you, I bet you have been in the room when you facilitated this and somebody shows the prototype and you realize that's exactly what we don't want to do. But we now, it's now clear that we spent, this is not what we want. It really means we need to focus on this. And so the irony is that failure generated an alignment that a million pound McKinsey engagement could never have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm going on here, but these are the kinds of, and I'm picking this word deliberately, experiences that I've, that I've lived with. And the, the, just to give the illusion of consistency here, that, that if you do the five by five right, mm -hmm. it affectively and effectively is a serious play exercise. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a, a production methodology. It's, 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 and in, it's a playful insight. It's a pig. Playful insight generator. How about that? There you go. Very good. Did you just come up with that? Do we have an acronym? Yes. yes. My mean time to acronym is, is astonishing. <laughs> wow. But I, I would say that that having re read your book, uh, and we, we would, um, again, oftentimes it's more of an ongoing uh, relationship with clients. Um, they would they would negotiate us down to go okay it's a one so it's a thousand mm. and it's three right. people over over eight weeks but it, mm. it's interesting going through uh, one of our needs to be rebranded but conversations and and getting to see the creativity and the 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 quick prototypes that you can build people will come out the other end and go you know what now I get prototyping let's let's bump up. Let's go to two or three or right. five or five. So and and then and then we're just running, like you said, it's a and then oftentimes we're really really trying not for one test but multiple. So if of it's course. Three, you, three, you want a portfolio, absolutely, absolutely. exactly. So so you know it's funny because this, as you you know you 
pointed out, the books that you're citing, I wrote <laughs> over a decade ago. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'm working on other things. And one of the interesting feedbacks I got is sort of like the mirror image or evil twin of what you've just discussed, mm -hmm. you know, which is we're trying to encourage people to be more experimental, playful, innovative, et cetera. And then the pushback you get is, well, how do we know? How do we know? And so the most recent work that I've been doing with, with MIT and others, through MIT and others, has been on key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we measure these things? And I think one of the really, really interesting opportunities and challenges you face, um, and given your background and, you know, what I saw on LinkedIn, service experience, whatever, service design, you know, which is what are the experiments we can do that might boost the CX rating, that might boost the CSAT, that might boost the, the NPS? What are the ingredients? Use the metric, not as a driver, but as sort of like a, the pole of a magnet to help organize the filings of, of you know, how people are trying to affect experience. What aspect, do, you know, do, are we trying to improve referrals? Are we trying to uh, uh, promote more of a DIY capability in this regard? So, so that use, and, and this is one of the things I've learned in the last three to five years, how do we leverage metrics that matter to be part of the organizing design principle for prototypes and experimentation. And where did I learn this? Because I had a couple of clients say to me, yeah, 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 I see the five by five is interesting, but what we really need to do is improve this aspect of the organization. Help me with this aspect of the organization. And so, you know, lazy, lazy bastard that I am, I said, let's do a hackathon slash five by five focusing on that aspect of the organization. And guess what? People stepped up on, on this. And just a closed loop, one of the most interesting things that phenomena that I observed, particularly in well-run companies, is that these teams would demonstrate their experiment, their approach, their model, their, their hypothesis to top management or the team of top management. And the top management said, well, I see why you did that, but couldn't we also do X? And Actually, you could do X. The team hadn't thought about it, but actually X would make that much better. And now everybody ends up looking smart because top management wouldn't have come up with that X input without the prototype. And now the team is thinking, actually, top management kind of knows what it's doing because not only do they get what we presented, they've come up with a constructive way of improving it, which brings us right back to your framing. It changes the conversation that the the innovators within an enterprise have michael i'm, I'm going to go into another I'm, you actually coined this phrase i'm going to be very impressed with it it's selvesware yes selvesware and and could you explain that term and how algorithms and you describe them which we loved pattern interpretation architecture yes has, because i think there, there's a techno uh, phobia to a lot of these the algorithms are going to set us down a course where we have no agency but i loved your your positive framing that it doesn't strip us of agency and it empowers us to become much more well well actually the the you've hit on and i don't mean to sound like a suck up you've hit on the exact right word it's agency to me the most interesting human challenge going forward is not climate change um with apologies to the extinction rebellion people who didn't break into the pub and mm. glue themselves to the to the bar um it's agency the future of agency where do we feel like we're being nudged at the nudge unit where do we feel like we have more choices or fewer choices because of data and algorithmic constraints why did i focus on this because i did a book on recommender systems recommendation engines and then i began to ask an obvious question it's it's a sickeningly obvious question, and you would think that Amazon and TikTok would have done stuff, and Microsoft would have done stuff on it, and I assure you they will. But it's like, okay, here are the books that are recommended for me. But 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 that's the average. Let's call that the centroid, Michael. What mm -hmm. books or materials or things or games should be recommended for the curious, Michael, the playful, Michael? In other words. With apologies to the Walt Whitman fans, I am vast and contain multitudes. There are many aspects and elements of me. So shouldn't I have a recommender 
but recognizes and supports that. Let's put that into your business. And, and we've seen these things. And, and by the way, this is one of the things that Generative and, and Dali does well. You know, get, do this painting in the style of Picasso, Klimt, Mondrian, Jackson Pollock. And so we can begin to do mashups of styles on this. I, 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 I'll tell you, and, and I'm sure you've done this exercise, but and, and it does tie into the salesware, but but what does salesware ask? It, it, it asks you to become more introspective, AI, augmented introspection, but it asks you to cultivate empathy with an awareness, situational awareness mm -hmm. of aspects of yourself that you don't really understand particularly well. So I would wager that at least a couple of your clients have asked you to put on workshops that what would Amazon coming into our business look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and is that a sales thing? No, it's a challenge to be someone else. So the essence of salesware is because data and algorithms allow us to to look at things from different angles and look at ourselves from different angles and express ourselves in different ways, why shouldn't we get advice and recommendation to expand the bandwidth of agency, to not minimize our multiple selves, but to, to do the other phrase, the Pareto persona. What are the 20% aspects of ourselves that generate 80% of the value? 80% of the creativity. We're not looking for perfection here. We're looking for, it's, you know, you look in a mirror, you look in a magnifying mirror, you know, the mirror, you can, you can now do this, of course, it ages you five years. Gee, I don't want to look like that. Do I want to change my exercise regime, change my diet, or, you know, get myself to the NHS for a cosmetic surgery? I have no idea. But, but that's what I was really trying to push at using these technologies to do exactly what you talked about, which is give people a greater and richer sense of what agency can and should be when we can, forgive me, seriously play with these tools. A lovely ending. And of course, we're going to link uh, your research uh, and all your books in the show notes. It's been um, an honor. I mean, yes. you really are one of the key metrics for us to yeah. say. I, I, I just I just hope it wasn't too painful. I, I feel like I, I, all, you've been soaking it all in and, and your students are extremely fortunate. You're, to, you're, oh, you, you're, have, you're, I, I, you. May, may, I, may I quote you on that? You, you may have more credibility in that. Than <laughs> that. My, my view is that I think I'll look better when you edit the transcript. Uh, again, I admire what you all are doing. I, I hope this was, again, wasn't too painful, but- but no, uh, I feel the pleasure. I, I, it, well, it really was for me. I, I, I it was, it, it turned out to be less painful than, than, than I thought. Uh, um, Although I still to... am going to get a drink after this. Yes, so. and, and us too. I think we all deserve it. <laughs> it's Friday. And our let's we, let's, we, let's, we, let's we end on that jovial. Uh, on, on that jovial note, and should I see you guys over there, I will spring for the Guinness or 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 alcoholic beverage or non-alcoholic or the yeah, mocktail. No, we will always drink sensibly. Of course. <laughs> great, great, great. That's, uh, yeah, again, you've identified a fundamental difference between us. On the <laughs> Cheers. Thank, you. Thank so you so much. Bye-bye. Take bye -bye. care. Bye -bye.